Chapter 62 Aisha Aisha had been a killer for many years, but only now did she feel like a criminal, waiting for Omar at the rendezvous point to wheel had specified. She sat in a cave at the outskirts of the sand sea, staring into the sunset. The sky looked like it was on fire, the clouds wisps of smoke. Why haven't you stopped me yet? she whispered to the air. The ifrit shifted somewhere in her mind. Because I made a deal with you. Aisha scoffed. A terrible deal. A jinn killer and a jinn cannot coexist. Silence, but then a soft chuckle. I never make bad deals. Aisha opened her mouth to protest, but it then decided it wasn't worth it. She'd grown accustomed to the Ifrit's non-answers. She dug her heels into the sand with a sigh as she watched the horizon, waiting for the familiar shadow of her king. She wondered what form he would take. When the undead voices started murmuring into the quiet, Aisha spoke again, asking a question that had been her on her mind for a long time. You can revive people from the dead, so why did you not become one with Munakid? Because he, unlike you, had already passed on. Had I brought him back, he would have been mindless as a ghoul. Aisha took a deep, shuddering breath. That is why I let his tribesmen dismember my body, because without Munakid, I was lost. And now, Aisha said, I have found you, and we are lost together. Aisha did not know how to respond, so she said nothing. She had felt the Ifrit's loss in her memories. She could not deny they had both suffered at the hands of murderers, jinn and human alike. She tried not to ponder that blurred line too deeply. If she started thinking about crimes caused by humans, senseless crimes like the slaughter of Lulian Lazari's tribe, she would start questioning everything about her sense of justice. And she could not afford to question things. Not now. She squinted at a blur of motion on the horizon and blinked a few times to make sure she was not seeing things. But no, there was the shadow. As it drew closer, Aisha saw it was Twil riding toward her. A falcon rested on his shoulder, but the moment he stopped at the cave, the bird flitted to the ground. It plucked at the bangle hanging from its legs, and then transformed into a man. A man Aisha respected, a man she feared. Instinctually, she got down to on one knee and dipped her head. What's this? You know better than to bow to me, Aisha. Rise. When she looked up, Prince Omar was smiling at her. He hardly looked like royalty in the simple tunic and pants. But he did look the part of a thief with a belt of daggers around his waist. Are you not the sultan now? I ought to show you the proper respect. Omar laughed. How can I be sultan when I am journeying with the midnight merchant? His eyes glittered with mirth. No, it will be weeks before the honor passes to me. Aisha rose to her feet. Normally she could look Omar in the eye without batting a lash. Now she found it difficult to hold his gaze. I lost the bangle, she murmured. Omar held up his relic. A small sacrifice. I have its twin. Besides, he stepped forward, the, that easy-going smile on his face as he reached toward her. Junaid and Tawil told me you have something far more valuable. He pushed away her scarf. Aisha was aware of the coolness of the collar around her throat. Omar touched a finger to the relic. Aisha became inexplicably violently sick. The word... The world blurred. She closed her eyes with a hiss. No, the resurrectionist said. Look. Aisha forced her eyes open and saw a phantom. A beautiful woman with soft brown eyes stood behind Omar, watching Aisha over his shoulder. Aisha did not know her, and yet she recognized her. Once they had been friends. While they both dealt in memories, Aisha, the resurrectionist, had been death, and this woman's magic had been life. I love humans, she'd once said. They are the gods' creatures, same as us, so why should we harm them? Because they seek to destroy us, the resurrectionists had replied. But her friend, ever the pacifist, have, had refused to believe this. They only fear us because we are more powerful. If we show them we are equals, they will not harm us. And they had tried, their king had tried, but the humans had abused his kindness. They had slaughtered jinn and stolen relics, and still Aisha's friend had said, I do not believe they are irredeemable. Those had been the last words she spoke to her before their world sank and she disappeared forever. Later, the resurrectionist felt her friend's death from a distance. 
but she had never known where or what her relic was. Aisha stared, the ifrit, the mystic she had once been called, smiled at her sadly, and then she was gone, dissipated into thin air as Omar drew his hand away. Have you heard a single thing I've said, Aisha? She swallowed. Yes, I was just distracted by the voices. Omar raised a brow. Voices? The dead, Aisha clarified. The relic lets me hear their voices. Omar stared at her. She knew that look. It was the soic facade he wore to stop others from gauging his reaction. Aisha forced herself to hold his gaze. Why was an ifrit following him? He had promised he would tell them when he found a king's relic, and she knew Omar. He would never allow anyone to tell him, not even a ghost. In my personal opinion, Saidi, Tawil smirked, I don't think Bitluas can handle the relic. Even in Giban, she was a little foggy-eyed. Aisha scowled. Me? Foggy-eyed? You're the one who had their treasure stolen. She could still remember his face when he apprehended her the morning after the merchant's sale. He'd been panicked, stuttering over his words as, words as he cursed her. Now his face contorted again as he glared at you. That's because you... Enough! Omar's voice was soft but dangerous, and Tawil stopped talking. We have no time to bicker. I've called for re reinforcements, and I do not want to be late for our rendezvous. He frowned. You know how long I have searched for this lamp? I will wait no longer. She did know. Omar had scavenged this area for years, looking for the relic. But it had not been until just recently when the Sultan commanded Prince Hakim to chart the location based on Amir's writing that Omar had finally pinpointed its location. Aisha wondered if he'd held off killing the Sultan for those coordinates, if he'd w waited patiently for an opportunity to frame his brother for his murder. She shoved thoughts of the prince away before they could sink in. She had always known that Prince Mazen was a scapegoat, but that did not lessen the weight of her guilt any. She owed him for saving her life. Besides that, she had come to find his company tolerable, enjoyable even, and now she had betrayed him, and he would never forgive her for it. You can still turn away from this, the resurrectionist murmured in her mind. Aisha clenched her fist. No, she couldn't. She wouldn't. You cheated death. Cheating a king would be easy. Enough, Aisha snapped. She didn't realize she'd spoken aloud until she noticed Omar and Tawil frowning at her. Voices again? Tawil said with a sneer. I would like to murder him, the ifrit murmured. That, that, at least, was one thing they could agree on. But Aisha pushed down the resurrectionist's annoyance and forced herself to nod. She breathed in deeply as Omar walked past. Tawil followed him with a huff. The moment his elbow connected with her shoulder, Aisha reached out and gripped his arm. Heat, sudden and bright and angry, pulsed through her fingers. Tawil pried his arm from her grip with a scowl, but he, she saw a muscle twitch in his jaw as he clenched his teeth. Let me be clear, he said. My king may trust you, but I do not. Aisha watched his back until it disappeared. She heard the echo of footsteps as Omar and Tawil descended a pathway that led beneath the sand sea. How the pathway existed beneath the sinking sand, Aisha did not know, but she was suddenly terrified to follow. I do not trust you either, she thought. It did not occur to her until later that the words were not just meant for Tawil. Chapter 63 Luli they traveled through the sand sea for many days, using the compass to guide them across the arduous landscape. Because the pathways running through the sinking sand were so narrow, they opted to leave the horses behind where someone from the outpost could find it. It was already a perilous journey without it, and yet Luli was glad the cross took all her concentration, because when she wasn't preoccupied with surviving, she lapsed into mourning for Ahmed bin Walid. By the end of every day, she was physically and emotionally drained, and yet sleep evaded her. When she closed her eyes, she saw Ahmed. Ahmed dancing her around the diwan, Ahmed eyes bright with wonder as she told him about her latest adventure. She remembered his buoyant laugh, his shining smile, and she remembered the word tattooed on his wrist, muklis, loyal, to her. The memories carved a hole in her heart. 
but though she felt hollow, she knew it was nothing in comparison to Mazen's sorrow. Try as he did to stifle his cries, she could hear him sobbing. It was only on the last night of their journey that his tears dried and his expression hardened. He was putting an armor, she realized, stealing himself for what was to come. The last night they set up camp on a patch of stable land in the middle of the sand sea. Kadir sparked a fire, took the last of their food provisions from their bag, and said, We reach the lamp tomorrow. Finally, Luli murmured. The ifrit inside this rija, Mazen shifted. In the firelight, his golden eyes were brighter, fiercer. What happens when we free them? Kadir shrugged. I haven't seen rija in hundreds of years. It is hard to say what captivity has done to their mind. But of all the ifrit, Rija is the most likely to pursue revenge. Silence hung in the air as Kadir roasted strips of dried meat over the fire. After a few moments, he added, If given the choice, I think they would kill your brother over you. That's not very reassuring, Mazen said. Luli groaned. None of this is reassuring. Calm as she was on the outside, she was internally panicking. The present was not the problem. She could throw herself into a fight, so long as she didn't have to consider the consequences. But she could not stop worrying about the what-ifs. What if Omar found the lamp first? What if he captured them? What if she was able to kill him? Murdering a forgotten thief to avenge her family was one thing, but murdering a prince set to take his father's place. She would never be able to show her face in this country again. Kadir sighed. Don't think too hard on it. What will be, will be. The words sparked a memory, a calmer moment aboard a ship. Luli smiled. Sage advice, O mighty Jin. Kadir smiled back at her. Mazen looked bewildered. Are you two always this calm before jumping into peril? The trick is to fake it until you make yourself believe it, Luli said. It was Kadir's advice, and she had never clung to it as fiercely as she did now. The next day, Luli strode ahead with the compass, slowly turning bends and stepping down crooked paths until she stopped. The compass's arrow was jittering so wildly it looked possessed. We've arrived, Kadir said. Luli eyed their surroundings skeptically. As far as she could see, this stretch of the sand sea looked the same as any other. She looked questioningly at Kadir, who shrugged and walked straight into it. The sand around him burned away, revealing a sloped tunnel that led into the sand sea. When Kadir turned to face them, the markings on his skin blazed golden red, and his eyes danced with fire. He sighed, and wisps of smoke curled out from his lips like shisha from a smoker's mouth. Luli rolled her eyes. Show off. Mazen simply stared, slack-jawed. Don't fall behind, Kadir said, and then he turned and walked deeper into the sand sea, burning a hole through the world as he did so. For a few moments, Luli stared quietly into the darkness. Fear, sudden and primal, froze her in place. Mazen stepped forward so that the two of them stood before the sand sea together. He flashed her a weak smile. Fake it until you make yourself believe it, right? Luli glanced one last time at the outside world at the sun hanging in the crystal blue sky and the smoky clouds in the distance. Determination sparked in her. I'll be back, she thought. They stepped into the darkness of the sand sea.